Episode 19, Fireside Frenzy, recorded July 2nd, 2013. Are you ready? See you red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat, featuring Dan, Matt, and Lucas. It's the week after the NHL entry draft, and I know I'm really excited. This is perhaps one of the most interesting weeks of the hockey season, between the new players coming in and the old faces getting new teams. I'm Dan, alongside Matt. Matt, how are you feeling right now? Very excited good. Excited about the draft? Did you enjoy watching it last weekend? Oh, did definitely. Did you watch all seven rounds in one day? Yes, I did. It was good to see the Flames take a big step forward in it their was. rebuild. And how do you feel about the picks overall? I'm very encouraged. I like all the first rounders. Some of the later picks, they're projects, but that's kind of expected, so can't well, complain. Let's run down the picks and who the Flames took. So with the sixth overall selection, their first selection in this year's entry draft, the Flames took, I think as was expected, Sean Monahan, a six foot two, hundred and eighty seven pound centerman. Any thoughts on Monahan? A big center who can win a face off, plays good in his own end and can score. Yeah, I think that might have been a good pick. <laughs> yeah, I think so. And what a lot of analysts have said too is he's a guy that may be able to make the jump to the NHL this year as well. Especially on a team that's weak on centermen. Yeah. Uh, either way, if he stays in Calgary or goes back to Ottawa, it's I a agree. win-win. And the second pick that the Flames had was the 22nd overall pick. That's the one they got in the Jay Bomeister deal. And they went a little bit off the board from what a lot of people expected and took left wing Emile Poirier, a six foot 183-pound left winger. What do you know about Poirier, Matt? In, in terms of style, he's uh, somewhat like Valerie Nikushkin, for those who were hoping that the Flames would take him. Uh, he drives to the net, he's extremely fast, he's got good hands. You know, there's not really anything that you can complain about. He led his team in scoring just like Monaghan did, and he was very impressive in the play in the QMJHL playoffs for Gatineau. I do believe he had 10 points in 10 games in the playoffs. Pretty good. So another good pick there. And then the third pick the Flames had in the first round was the 28th overall pick, the one they acquired for Jerome McGinla. And they took Morgan Klimchuk, a player that uh, you were saying earlier Montreal had their eye on as well. No, that was Poirier. Oh, Poirier. But... Okay. So Klimchuk's a five foot eleven, hundred and eighty pound left winger, another left winger who played for Regina last year. And what do you know about Klimchuk? Uh, he has an extremely quick release on his shot, which that will lend more to him being a goal scorer in the NHL. Beyond that, like I know he plays like uh I know they were saying on TSN that he's somewhat like Steve Larmer. Uh, just a player that you'd hate playing against. So, if he works out, then that's, you know, as good of a pick that you could get with number 28. And then 28. I'm just going to quickly run down the rest of these. I think these are all our lower round picks. And chime in if there's any of them that you know anything about or want to chime in on. The Flames didn't have a pick in the second round. Um, but then in the third round, with a 67th overall pick, they took a defenseman, Keegan Kanzig, who's six foot five, 241 pounds. That's a big boy. Oh yeah. At worst, he'll definitely be defending our prospects in the AHL. Whether or not he takes a step forward and actually can become an NHL defenseman is up to him. But yeah, you need someone to protect the young well, players. Well, as I've always said, um, every episode when we talk about young guys, not everybody gets to play in the NHL either. You do need guys to play at the AHL and ECHL levels. And at worst, you know, he will be very good at that. He'll protect the, all our goaltenders, and, you know, he is a very tough player. He won most of his fights this year, so... 
And There's for a team that. that wants to get grittier, that sounds like he's probably a good pickup. Mm-hmm. The next pick they made, the Flames took round four off. They had no pick in the fourth round and came back to the table in round five for the 135th overall pick and took Eric Waugh, a defenseman from Brandon of the WHL. He's 6'2", 180 pounds. What do you know about Waugh? Uh, he's an offensive defenseman. He's actually... The knock on him is that he's lost in his own end. Uh, not too dissimilar from TJ Brody when he was drafted. Whether or not he can figure out how to play defense or not, you know, it's yet to be seen. But he was initially thought to be a possible first round pick and slid to the fifth. And because he's six foot two, he, you know, with his offensive instincts, he could possibly be converted to a forward later on. So that's quite a slide for a guy to move from being projected in the top 30 to getting picked 135th. That's almost a 100-position uh, slide on the on the draft charts. Well, every year there's one or two guys like that that just fall because like, their season wasn't... They didn't take the usual step forward that you know a normal first-rounder does. So, And those guys usually end up being a really good bargain for the team they end up being a you know a surprise superstar or a big bust so we'll see which the which one this guy becomes the flames took in round six a player that the nhl didn't even seem to know existed they took centerman tim harrison from dexter prep high school he's six foot three 175 pounds he's still in high school I don't know if you're watching the draft, but when the Flames took him, the NHL seemed to have to call them up to verify this guy was actually a real person. Yeah, our Taro Sujimoto, I guess. But uh, no, he's uh, one of our scouts last year. The guy that discovered Mark Jankowski also found him and campaigned heavily for the Flames to take him. He's known as a bit of a crash and bang winger type, but he's also uh, can put some points on the board. He had a 1.75 point per game average in his high school league, and now he will be heading to the NCAA. So we'll have four years to determine whether or not to. And you sign know, him. for a guy in the sixth round, I think if we do take four years and decide we want to sign him, great. We made a lot out of that pick, but if after four years the Flames decide, you know what, this guy's just not cut out to get an NHL contract or an AHL contract, no harm done. I mean, he's a sixth-round pick. I think everyone's kind of expecting him to just be cut loose. Yeah, and at worst, uh, you know, he is a sixth-round pick, so maybe four or five players actually make the NHL from that far in the draft so if not well we'll just join the other 25 teams there you go also didn't so it's not like there's any egg on our face i mean he's not expected he's not projected to do very much no it's it's just a pleasant surprise if he does and then the flames had two picks in the seventh round uh with their first seventh round pick they drafted 187th overall and got a guy named, and I don't even know if I'm saying this right, Rushan Rafikov. He's a defenseman. 6'1", 185 pounds, and he played in the Russian Junior League last year. Do you know much about him? Uh, not much, other than he's a tough-as-nails type defenseman. Uh, when the Flames were scouting Nikushkin, um, Craig Conroy called up Igor Kravchuk, who was Nikushkin's coach, and he kept that name, Rafikov, kept coming up in their conversation, and so the Flames decided to take a flyer on him in the Why seventh round. Why not? Again, at that level, as we just said, you're not expected to to make it very far. Why not take a flyer and hope it works out? Yeah, uh, like if it wasn't for the whole KHL thing, he would probably have went in the second or maybe third round. So at in the seventh round, if you can actually convince him to come over, you might end up getting a NHL player for you know a seventh round pick. So you can't really complain. No, that's that's really good. 
And the last pick the Flames made, another defenseman with the 198th overall pick, they took a 5'11 defenseman named John Gilmore. And I did some research. No, he's not related to Doug Gilmore. Uh, he played for Providence was, of the NCAA last year. Yeah, he was teammates with both Jankowski and Jonathan Gillies. So they saw a lot of him. He's a 20-year-old defenseman and will have his rights for the next four years, just like Harrison. So plenty of time to see whether or not he's worth a contract And we're probably going to have a lot of scouts down there anyways. We've got what, three guys in that team now, so he'll get looked at heavily over those four years, I would imagine. Mm-hmm. So if we go back to the top three guys, the three kind of pinnacle players in what was deemed the Flames' most important draft in history by some, Monaghan, Poirier, and Klimchuk. Who do you bring up? Who do you give an NHL shot to this year? If it was me, I think I would give Monaghan a shot, and I don't think I'd give the other two guys any more than a game or two at the end of the season. Yeah, uh, nine games for maybe Monaghan and Klimchuk, if they, you know, if they are doing good in training camp. If not, you know, like I, I'd actually prefer all three being in juniors to start the year and just, you know, go and kick ass. <laughs> and, yeah, let them know. chew up a lot of training camp minutes and exhibition minutes and then send them down to junior where they can just play their game. I mean, all three guys are huge point scorers as it is. Let them continue doing that. And I don't think anyone else uh, lower down in this draft has any chance at making the team this year. We have guys who I think would be higher on every depth chart than uh, Kanzig, Waugh, Harrison, Rafikov, and Gilmore. So overall, you're pleased with the draft? Oh yeah. Well, with the first round picks, all three of them, they are going to be NHL players. Like, they might not be star caliber, but with, like, Klimchuk's shot, he's going to be, uh, at worst, like, Lee Stepniak, a second, third line scorer type. And Poirier is just so fast that he's going to be, at worst, a guy like Matthew Lombardi or Andrew Cogliano. If his hands develop, then he might be a star player, but, you know... It, each of those guys will be NHLers. Well, and to me, that's all you can ask for with three first-round picks, and especially two late in the first round, is guys that project for the NHL. I mean, you can't have a whole team of first-line superstars, so somebody has to pick up the second and third line. No, you need a supporting cast, and those three players, each of them, you know, like, even Monaghan might not be a superstar, but he... The his style of game is somewhat reminiscent of Scott Gomez back when he was with New Jersey and like the sixty point seventy point shut down to center. So you know you you need that as well. It you know at worst he's that kind of guy. So you know he might be a seventy eighty point guy. Who knows? But you know if you're even at Number six, if you can get a solid 60-point two-way center, you know, like, that's awesome. So, not really anything to complain no, about. and I know there's some noise that was being made online through Twitter and Facebook when the Flames took Poirier over Shin Carrick. Um, I think Poirier is the better player. I think he's the better person and the guy you want on the team. Yeah, like, there's no attitude problems with Poirier, um, Shin Karuk, he does have, he's a little bit cocky, and, you know, that, that's good if you're a star caliber player, but if you're in the middle of the first round, that's perhaps not a good thing. You know, like, you can tolerate that kind of thing from Patrick Kane when he was drafted, because he was the best player in his draft, but... When you're, like, the 15th best player in the draft, you know, that's a little bit of a detractor for me. Yeah, no, I agree with you there. While we're talking about the draft, Jay Feaster said going into the draft that the Flames were going to be open for business. And at the end of the day, he did nothing, really. He went in with eight picks. He drafted all the same eight picks he went in with. 
and he made no trades. There was a lot of rumors. There were rumors he was talking to Vinny LeCavalier. There were rumors he was in on um, on Tyler Sagan. Are there any deals that you heard that day, potentials that you thought he should have jumped on or wished he would have jumped on or glad he didn't jump on? Well, the two main trade rumors were both with Sagan from Boston and with Philly for Braden Coburn, Matt Reed, and number 11 for number 6. And in each case, I'm glad they did not choose to go that route. With the Philly deal, those two players, they would have improved the team next year, but not by enough to actually make the playoffs. And because we're in a rebuild, you know, you don't want half measures, you know. And, like, each of those players is good, but they're also 26 and 27, so, you know, it's not that helpful. Yeah, I think that all of those players, uh, the guys from Philly, the Sagan deal from uh, Boston, I think it would be useful at a different time in our rebuilding process. Right now, we're at the lowest part of the rebuilding process. And if we were on that upswing, if we were the team that's starting to gain some momentum, we've rebuilt our stars, we got our pieces in place, and we're looking for those young guys who can lead the team for five or six years, I definitely think Sagan or Coburn would be great to pick up, but not right now. No. Like, if we were in Edmonton's shoes, getting a guy like Sagan or Coburn and Reed... Like, those deals make sense, because, you know, they're trying to be a playoff team now, they're out of the rebuild phase, that makes sense. But for us, like, going into the weekend, we only had Jankowski, Gaudreau, and Berchi as offensive prospects that were stood a good chance to be NHLers, like, that's not nearly good enough. if you wanted Sagan, (laughs) you'd probably have to give up at least two of those three. Possibly, or several of the first rounders. So, yeah, we we need assets, and yeah, the it's just not the right time for that. Yeah. And plus, with Sagan, he also makes five point seven five million next year. So, like, realistically, if you were to just go and sign Nathan Horton for that kind of money, like, there's not. A huge amount of difference in terms of production that you're going to get out of them heading into next season. They're like even Sagan is not going to make you a playoff team next year. Yeah, it's year. very true, and that's I think the biggest thing that we have to keep in mind, and Flames management has to keep in mind, is we're not trying to be a playoff team next year. We have to do this rebuild properly, and that's going to mean a couple heartbreaking years for Flames fans. Yeah, it it's disappointing and frustrating that like the flames aren't going to be a viable playoff team unless the stars will manage to align just the right way next year but i would rather the flames not be as competitive for two or three seasons and then be a a team that's primed and ready to be the next chicago or the next Boston, or the next Pittsburgh, who just steamrolls everybody, instead of trying to middle your way through and not really hitting the peaks that you could. Yeah, I agree with you, and I think there's two ways you can do this. The Flames could do what they've been trying to do unsuccessfully, but they could do it successfully, build a team to go to the playoffs once, and then have to disassemble the team. Or take the hardship... Wait three, four years while we rebuild properly. And like you said, then we'll be like a Blackhawks team or even a Penguins team. We're competitive on a regular basis. And we're going to the finals on a regular basis. Yeah. Like, I'd rather the team be good enough where we can actually possibly win a cup instead of, you know, like our ceiling being like, oh, we won a division title once or twice before having to rebuild yeah. again. Yeah, no, I agree. This should be a rebuild that's planting the seeds for a long time. 
And talking about the rebuild, let's talk about some of the f- the changes the Flames have made since the last time we broadcast. Uh, just a couple days after we recorded the last show, you and I were talking on the last show about veterans that we wanted to see shipped out or we thought might be shipped out, and the Flames actually moved two of those guys. We both thought Tange would be moved, and I was really impressed because we finally found a buyer for Sarah, which I was hoping would happen. We shipped them both to the Avalanche in exchange for David Jones and Shane O'Brien. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that uh, attitude does matter. And, like, with Jones and Shane O'Brien, they're coming here realizing that we're in a rebuild and how best to help the rebuild. And so, like, that's their mental focus. When we signed Tange and Sarich, we were trying to be a playoff team. And so they're mindset is oh we need to be a playoff team and that's not necessarily the attitude that you want in a rebuild someone a pair of people that might be not thrilled (laughs) going through the whole rebuild process well not just guys that aren't thrilled but i mean let's be honest the avalanche are going through a bit of a rebuild of their own i mean they're not a competitive team right now and so i think jones and o'brien have been in that situation know what it means to be in that situation and so they can appreciate it but I think they can almost be locker room leaders in a way too by helping to usher the young guys in and explain to them what their role is in a team like that because these are guys that have already gone through it in another organization Mm -hmm. and exactly like with the Avalanche like they're starting to come out of their rebuild a bit like they got enough pieces in place where like they can actually start getting veteran players and start putting their stamp on, like, trying to get back into the playoffs. So, you know, it makes sense for them to go that route, whereas for us, we're on the opposite end of that. Yeah, and and I'm just glad that we found a buyer for Sarich. I ended up thinking that we'd have to take some bad contracts back if we were going to move them. I'm really happy with that deal. I think it's four players that all needed a new home and a new change of scenery. And I think they're all getting exactly what they need. Both teams win on that one. Yeah. Another trade I'm really happy with is the trade that came down today, actually. And that the Flames traded their fourth round draft pick in 2015, that's two years from now, to the San Jose Sharks for TJ Galliardi. Um, and then immediately went and signed him to a one-year, $1.25 million deal. I'm really happy with this. I think Galliardi's a good player. He'll really help the rebuild. And it's another guy up front where the Flames might be able to slot him in a depth slot so they don't need Monaghan to play a full-time role here. Well, a long time ago I was saying that the Flames should try and get someone like Eric Nystrom. Uh, because he has the right attitude and he's, you know, he gives it all on the ice. Well, that's exactly what they got in TJ Galliardi. Someone that he does give 100% effort on the ice, at least from the games I've seen him in. And while his stats haven't been exactly the best... You know, he is a 25-year-old. He did have a 40-point season in his rookie year. And, you know, at at worst, he's someone that could teach guys like Reinhardt and Horak and all that how to be NHLers, even if they're only third- or fourth-line guys. Yeah, I mean, we've said um, in previous shows that we really don't want the Flames to have a bunch of guys with no NHL experience, almost like the Oilers have done. That's the blind leading the blind. We want guys with NHL experience, guys who know what they're doing and know how to play the NHL game. And I really think that Galliardi has played for a, I mean, let's call them a semi-successful team in the Sharks. So he knows what winning looks like at the NHL level. He knows what that takes. And so he's the kind of guy that can bring that kind of mentality to a rebuilding team. Yeah. Well, even when he was with Colorado, they were still a playoff team. So, you know, he kind of does know what that kind of thing takes. And, you know, we need the players that are on the third and fourth lines moving forward to be players that do give it their all. 
and, well, quite frankly, the players that are on the first two lines as well. So having that kind of persona on the team, it'll rub off on the new people that get plugged in there. So, like, when Monaghan and Poirier and Klimchuk come in, like, they'll see that these players are giving their all on their shift and, you know, oh, well, I have to do that if I want to be here. And, you know, like, that does nothing but do good things down the yeah. road. At $1.25 million, I think Galliardi is a perfect fit on this team. I'm really happy with that signing. Even if he was at even if he was at two million dollars, that would be fine too. So, yeah. And the cost to get him, giving up a fourth round pick in two years. I mean, who knows where we'll be in two years or what the draft class will look like? I'm happy with that too. They're projecting long enough in the future, and they're finally not trading a second round pick. Yeah. Well, that's another thing that the Flames needed to do is look at teams to see what. Uh, their contract status was with certain players and especially with uh, the Sharks getting Tyler Kennedy during the draft for one of their second round picks like that you know it, it he took Galliardi's place so you know now Galliardi's available so now we got him for the fourth and it's just like when we got Corbin Knight from Florida it's, you know, capitalizing on another team not having the availability to keep certain players. Yeah, and I mean, you can't keep everybody, and that's, you know, that's what makes the league interesting. But mm-hmm. talking about not, keep, uh, not keeping everybody, um, the Flames made nine RFA qualifications today. So they, they've got, most of their RFAs look like they'll probably be coming back. The guys they did qualify were Michael Backlund, Carter Banks, I'm kind of surprised with that one. Lance Boma, Paul Byron, Greg Nemitz, uh, defenseman Chris Breen, defenseman Chris Butler. Now, we know that if Lucas was here, he'd probably have a, a fit over that one because we know how Lucas feels about Butler. Uh, TJ Brody, no question there, and Mark Kandari, no question there. I think they had to do both of those guys. And that leaves the guys without a qualifying offer from the Flames. Akima Lou, uh... Brian Cameron, Brady Lamb, and Galen Patterson. No surprises to me on that list. I think that everyone, I guess, on the list of guys that didn't qualify, I'm surprised that Carter Banks did get a qualifying offer. Uh, I'm actually not with Carter Banks. Like He isn't a, the most talented player, but he's another one of those types that does give it 100%. And even on the AHL team, you need players that do give that effort because it does nothing but create a winning atmosphere. So, you know, uh, yes, you'd like to see better prospects come up, but, you know, you still do need the foot soldiers, and Banks is one of those types. Now, we should remind people listening that this doesn't mean the Flames have signed all of these guys. All it means is that by putting in a qualifying offer, they're retaining the rights to all of those players as restricted free agents. So they still have to go and sign each and every individual guy on that list that they want to keep. So you know guys like Brody, Kandari, Backlund, you're not going to get them for the minimum qualifying offer. There's going to be more negotiations there. Yeah. And guys like Banks and that, those guys will likely just accept the qualifying offer and, you know, just be happy for the contract. Yeah, so but I mean, there's still there's still some work for the Flames to do here to get their NHL roster all signed up. Yeah, with that, um, because the Flames have, like, nearly $20 million in cap space, what I would just wait and see is if teams are kind of screwed in terms of because the cap dropped six million dollars and see if you can't manage to snag another good player for not so much money yeah Yeah, that's it either get them on an amnesty buyout or try to take on somebody's big contract um in a trade scenario so the other way the team can improve right now in this time of year, in three days, uh, UFA season opens, unrestricted free agency. 
And the Flames are not losing that many guys. The free agents they have are Brian McGratton, Steve Bajan, Anton Babchuk, and Brett Carson. Um, any of those guys that you would re-sign if you were the GM? I'd probably bring McGratton I back. Would... Yeah, um, I would bring McGratton back and I would probably give Bajan an invite to camp again. Yeah, yeah, like, if he makes the team, then... Yeah, let him work for it. And, like, if he... Yeah, and, like, or even sign him to an AHL contract. Yeah, you could do a two-way deal. Give him the... You know, either way, like, it's one of those things that depends. Like, if we go out and sign a guy like Eric Nystrom, for lack of a better name, you know, that would fill his spot, then okay, but... If not, he wouldn't be a bad option. Babchuk is already committed to playing in Russia next year, so he won't be coming back. And to meet Brett Carson, you can fill that role with a ton of different defensemen. I wouldn't re-sign him either. I think right now, change just for the sake of change might be a good thing. Yeah, like, how would you say that? They don't, he didn't make a as good of a impact that oh I have to keep him he he was just there a uh, placeholder and you know you can fill that with any of a dozen and some people big names that are also being let go by the Flames as UFAs uh from the farm team we have Leland Irving and Chris Kalanos Mike Tesswide and Danny Taylor to me, none of those names are surprising. I mean, we went through a bit of a, a goalie shakeup this year, and while Danny Taylor looked good, I think the Flames are going to have so many goalies coming in next year vying for an AHL spot that Taylor would get lost in that mix and I don't think would make the AHL. Neither would Leland Irving. So I think it's time to cut those guys loose and let them try their luck with another franchise. Yeah. One of the things I was disappointed in is that we didn't take a goalie this year in the draft, but, you know, like, we just need to keep getting more goalies until we get someone that can be a starter. I'm expecting both Red Obera and uh, Yanni Ordeo to be the two goalies on the farm to start the year. So you think that makes Ramo and McDonald the NHL team then? Yeah, and I just don't, there's just no room, you know, both Irving and Taylor, they're okay, but, you know, you gotta keep cycling, you know, they were both given opportunities, they didn't step up to say, oh, keep me, so you go next and, you know, let Barra and Ordeo play if they step up good if not then i think you're actually doing irving and taylor a favor by not signing them to a contract because you're letting them go find a team who doesn't have such a crowded crease and make a name with that team yeah like if irving or taylor go to wherever and actually become an nhl starter good for them yeah or even a job as a full-time ahl starter I mean, that's what they're familiar with, that's what they're good at, and there's money in being an AHL starter if you're a good one. Yeah, like, I don't have anything against either of those guys. It's just it doesn't benefit the Flames to hold on to someone that's not showing any progression No, I've always liked Irving. I've liked him since they first drafted him, and I always thought he was a good up-and-coming goaltender. But to me, if I look at the depth chart, he's not high enough to re-sign him. I think I'd rather use that spot on our 50 contract list for somebody else. And who knows? He could always come back. You know, if he does well, maybe, you know, three years from now he becomes a UFA again, you can always bring him back. But at this point in his development, the best thing we can do is let him go to another organization. Yeah. So while we're talking about UFAs, um, I know you've talked all year about wanting to bring Eric Nystrom back. Who else would you like to see the Flames go after when free agency opens on Friday? Normally, I don't like having retreads. You know, like, if you get rid of a guy, then just let him go. But, amusingly, this year, I'd like to actually see both Eric Nystrom and Andrew Ferentz return. (laughs) 
Why not? You know, the, each of them, are, they play the game the right way. They have the right attitude that you want in a player. And they'd both be good teachers. I'd overpay each of them to, to have them on the team because, really, the cap doesn't matter for us And right even now. overpaying those guys, you're still going to get them at a reasonable price. Yeah, like, if you're overpaying Ferentz, you're going to give him, like, three and a half million dollars, and Nystrom, you're going to give him two and a half. So, Still very reasonable. And, like, that's overpaying. Yeah, like, that. that's not something where, you know, like, you're giving the guy six or seven million dollars. So, yeah, it, we we just need players that have the that right attitude and mental fit on this team to to teach any new players that are coming in how to play the game properly. Yeah, I agree. Is there anyone you would like to see Feaster sign that isn't a retread? Somebody that has never worn the Flaming Sea before in their career but you think would do well here? Uh, like, you could go and sign someone like a Steven Weiss or a Tyler Bozak as, like, a placeholder for a couple of years so you're not, in, you know, embarrassingly bad. But... It's one of those things where, eh, the UFA class isn't exactly exceptional, so... I was, uh, I was looking at Tyler Bozak. He's a him. center. We need centermen. He's making 1.5 this year. If you could get him for even 2.2 or less, he's 26. Oh, he, he, is, he is asking about $5 oh, wow. million, dollars, so, yeah. Uh, even if you signed him for four and a half, like... Put him on a you short-term know, a deal temporary... might not be a bad thing. Yeah, because realistically, the Flames aren't going to be a playoff team for two or three seasons. So if you sign them for a three-year deal, then, you know, that kind of fits for like when we're going to be decent again. I'm just again. looking through the free agent list here. Um, uh, yeah, I think Stephen Weiss would be not a bad guy to go after either. He's going to be a bit more expensive. Um, there's a lot of guys on the list, but... As usual, I think that you're going to have a harder time attracting free agents when you're a rebuilding team. And I want Feaster to avoid really overpaying. If it were me and I were the GM, I'd probably almost sleep in on the 5th, don't sign anybody, and come in on the 6th and see what's left. That way I'm not playing in sweepstakes that I shouldn't be playing in. Yeah. It's just one of those things where... Yeah, like, you would like to get players to improve the team, but even if we signed all of the good free agents, Briere, Ginla, Eliash, yada, 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 like, and keep going, like, we're not going to be a playoff team. So, what's One guy the I could point? see the Flames go after, and I'm not... I guess I'd like to see him here, because I believe you do need some veteran presence, but I could see the Flames making an offer for Nathan Horton and bringing him in as the captain, kind of that grizzled veteran. Even though he's only 27, he's been around the league for a long time. I could see them bringing him in as that kind of that grizzled veteran, the guy who's supposed to score all the points for this team. Yeah. uh, With any of the name free agents like a Horton or a Weiss or Bozak or anything, yeah, if it's on a short-term three-year deal yeah, or Yeah, I could drop, I drop six million awesome. on Horton for two years. Yeah, like I don't have any complaints on any player if it's for less than three years. I don't even mind overpaying because... We have the room. You know, yeah, we have $20 million in cap space and really nobody that... To sign. Yeah, and so, even looking forward at two, three years, we're probably not going to need all that cap space, say, next year, where we're going to regret that signing in, by this time next year. I think we can easily sign somebody and have it, you know, be comfortable with that uh, signing for two or three years, or however long the contract is. Mm hmm. Well, like, even next season, uh, the only players that are unrestricted are Camilleri, Stajan, Stempniak, Blair Jones, and Tim Jackman. 
like other than Camilleri, like that's yeah, and I, and I would even question if we would resign Camilleri next year. Oh no! Well, each of the UFAs we'd likely deal at the deadline, but you know, like it's not a huge amount of cap to get back, is what I'm yeah. getting at. Like, and even though we are a rebuilding team. You do need somebody to kind of be, and it's a weird word to use in a rebuilding team, but be the superstar, be the face of the organization, and the guy who scores the most points for the team without many points. I think a Nathan Horton would be yeah. good in that role. Yeah. Well, even uh, Camilleri being in that role next year, if he's on the team... You know, we can always parlay that at the deadline and for more draft picks and all yeah. that. Another so. guy that might be a dark horse that could end up here could be Michael Ryder. Um Possible. But I think they would probably go after a center, and I think he's a winger. Yeah, he's a right winger. And I could second. even see them maybe bringing in a veteran center and somebody like a Mike Ribeiro. Oh, well, I actually think that they would be best to avoid Ribeiro just for his whole attitude... You know, he's not exactly a character player. I'd rather <laughs> I'd rather go a different yeah. route. There's lots of options though, but I just hope that the I was hoping the Flames wouldn't get involved in the Vinny Cavalier sweepstakes and now those are over. He's going on the Flyers. Um so yeah. I don't really know I'm trying to think who else I guess there's still some big money guys that could draw a lot of attention, but I hope the Flames don't play in those and that we like you said, we need to we need to get the right guys for a rebuild with the right attitude, but we also need to get guys who might be um might be a big scorer here, might be the guy that we can lean on, especially as fans, to say this is our star now that Iggy's gone. Yeah. Well, the player that I would actually like to see given a shot is Valtteri Fipula from the Red Wings. Um I think there's gonna be a big sweepstakes for him though. Well, he didn't have a really good season this year, points-wise. So, you know, we might be able to get him, you know, because realistically the flame centers are Matt Stajan and, you know, like there's really not much to compete with. So someone like Philpula who might want to cash in next season might sign a one-year deal here where he's going to be the guy. Yeah. So, it just depends, really. Do you think that the Flames should or would be able to take a run at somebody like a Victor Stahlberg? If the money is right, they could probably get any free agent. Like, it, if you recall, like, Florida a couple of years ago, they went on a spy, or a buying spree during UFA day, uh, but they overpaid everybody by, like, a million, million and a half each player. So, you know, if we did the same, we could probably go and sign four or five guys. But Like, I think that if we could get Stahlberg at 1.25, like we're paying Galliardi, I don't think that's that much of an overpayment. It's a little bit of an overpayment. But I think he could fit well in the team for that cost. It's one of those things, like, even if it was two million or two and a half, it doesn't matter if it's a short-term deal. Like, we could even go after a guy like Damian Bruner, who also played with the Red Wings. Like, there's a lot of interesting pieces that we could choose from. It just really depends on dollars, attitude, whether they want to go through a rebuild or not. It all depends. And the Flames have had pretty good success of picking up the lesser-known... Uh, free agents on that free agent frenzy day, either that day or a couple days after. And, you know, guys like a, a Curtis Glencross, who nobody's fighting for, but we have on our radar and we bring in, and they do very well for this team. Yeah, well, like even Tange and Yoka, mm-hmm. when they were re signed, like that, everybody was going, you know, mocking Sutter when he did that. But they ended up being the two best signings of the entire free agent yeah. market. So, it just depends. And, 
Like, I wouldn't be in a real rush to go and get any specific player, because it doesn't really matter. They're just going to be a temporary placeholder anyway to teach the kids. So, yeah. It's hard to get really enthusiastic for the team next season. Like, realistically, the Flames have more to look forward to in terms of the draft and that kind of thing instead, unfortunately. Yeah, but as hardcore Flames fans, you know that we'll both be cheering for the team either way. Oh, yeah. I still think there's a lot to look forward to, to but you have to look at it in a different way. You're not looking at it as I'm looking forward to playoffs this year, but I'm looking forward to seeing these guys progress, and I'm looking forward to seeing how this team's coming together and the long-term vision being played out. Yeah, like I'm... Very interesting to see if TJ Brody is going to become that really good number one defenseman next year. Is Backlund going to be a top six player? Is Berchi going to be a top six player? How are the other guys like Reinhardt and Horak and all them going to play? So, like, there's enough to actually keep your interest. It's just tough if you're looking only towards the playoffs. Yeah, and I think that now, especially now that the GM is not even using that term, or is using the term rebuild, um, I think that everyone is on the same page and knowing what to expect. So I think anyone that is looking towards the playoffs next year is a bit delusional. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like the stars would have to align, like Kari Rama would have to be the next Dominic Kasich, and the other players on the team would all have to, like, step up in, you know, unrealistic manners. <laughs> I think if I think if the Flames go deep in the playoffs next year, a lot of coaches and GMs will lose their jobs. Yeah, pretty much. Because, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're not poised for that. We're not built for that. So if we can sneak... No. If we can sneak deep in a playoff spot with this team, something's gone wrong with the league. Yeah. Like, if we're outside the top five in the draft next year, some, you know, what's wrong with the other teams? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and how much worse must they be? Yeah, because, like, even if you look at the teams that picked ahead of us this year, none of them on paper are worse than what Calgary is heading into next season. So, you know, like, I just don't see how anybody else could regress to the levels that we're at in only one season well i think there's a lot to look forward to i know that the next date on my calendar for this team is july 5th which is when free agency opens and depending Mm -hmm. on what the flames do if there's anything interesting um i think we'll be back for another episode if you're up for that so we'll see what the team does and then we'll make an assessment from there Oh, yeah. And it'll be interesting to see exactly how... Like, I'm actually looking forward to the Flames development camp next week uh, from the 6th to the 11th at Windsport. So, you know, get to see all the kids that were just drafted. Are you going to go to any of the development All of our other prospects. Camp? Oh, yeah. Well, I live like five minutes away from there, so it's no big deal. Go. All right, well, anything else you want to get off your chest? No, I'm just thrilled with how this past week has gone, and I I give the Flames full marks for everything they did. They picked all, like, their first-rounders. They're all, three of them are going to be NHLers just from their natural skills, whether they're only second- or third-line guys or, you know, the actually developing the stars is up to them, but yeah, you know, I, I can't complain with the single thing they yeah, did. Yeah, I think the trades that have been made, the uh, Avalanche trade, two for two, and the Galliardi trade, are definitely the team showing that they want to move in the right direction. And yes, they're not superstar deals, they're not blockbuster deals, but they're small moves that are going to help the Flames move towards the goal they need to complete. So I'm really happy with the trades they've done too. Overall, I think it's probably the most positive week we've had for this team in as long as I can remember, maybe since the start of the shortened season. 
Well, the thing is, is that I know a lot of <clears throat> people give Feaster, you know, questionable marks, but ever since he's actually started to rebuild in earnest, the, he's done a lot of good moves. You know, between Galliardi, Corbin Knight, the draft picks, even the Ginland Bowmeister trades, they were all good, so... You know, I hope he keeps it up. Yeah, I don't think there's much that... If you take an honest look and evaluate where the team's at going into a rebuild, I don't think there's a lot that you can complain about with Feaster. I think that he's doing the rebuild the way it needs to be done. Yeah. And hopefully in three or four years we see the benefit of that and that the Flames can be a contender like Chicago, LA, and the well, other teams have Well, that's kind of what been. we're all banking on right now, isn't it? Yep, a little paint. A, a little paint today is you know a small price to pay for something like a Stanley exactly. Cup tomorrow. Exactly, and you know so. the old saying: "Good things come to those who wait." So if we can wait and we can build the team, we might be able to do like Chicago and win two cups in four years. Yep. All right, Matt. Well, with that, let's wrap this thing up, and we will talk to you shortly after the unrestricted free agency opens. Have a great week. Have a good week, everybody. We are the boys of chorus. We hope you like our show. We We know you're rooting for us, but now we have to go. Fireside Chat Podcast, produced and edited by Dan Stevenson.